Jeremiah 29, 11, in the New Living Translation, the Bible says this, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good. They're not plans for disaster. They're plans to give you a future and to give you a hope. You see, God already has predestined for you a plan for your life. He already knows the end from the beginning, am I right? The Bible says he knows the end from the beginning. So he has a destination for you that you're supposed to accomplish in this short span, the dash on our tombstone that we call life. You have a purpose on planet Earth. Your purpose is not just merely to exist, to breathe the air, to have enough food to barely make it, make enough money just to pay your bills, die someday, and maybe hopefully make it to the pearly gates. That is not your purpose. You have a purpose that's bigger than you. He said, I've already got a plan for you, and it's a plan for good. It's not a plan for evil. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life. Not just life, but abundant life. You know what that means? A life that overflows more than enough. Jesus himself said, I've come to give you abundant life. Why then do we often settle for just life? Why then do we often just settle for the monotony and the mundane lifestyle of just doing work, doing church, doing work, doing church? I told my wife this week, man, I don't even know where 2019 went. I've been working like crazy, going nuts, churching like crazy. That's what we call it, churching. Churching like crazy, you know, from, from doing revivals to doing conferences to doing the hub now. Churching like crazy. And I said, where did 2019 go? I don't even know where it went. I blinked and we're already getting, she wants to put the Christmas tree up tomorrow. Because she knows in November I'm not going to be home. I'm going to be hunting deer. Okay? She said, put that thing out of the attic. We're going to put the Christmas tree. I said, how is it Christmas time? Well, it's not, but the Hallmark Movie Channel says it is. 40 new ones this year if you guys are counting. 2019's gone almost. And what did I accomplish? I made some money, I paid some bills, but really, what did I do? What did I do in this little dash of 2019 that made this year significant? Ask yourself the same question. Am I really living life abundantly? Because I know he's got a plan for me. Many people live a subpar life because they've settled. We trust our own judgments fail to trust God's plan for our lives. You see, we're playing checkers with our lives. God plays chess. He thinks out every single move. Well, I'm trying to think how I'm going to get to the next piece on the board. He's already thinking how he's going to get checkmate. And often our checkers gets in the way of God's chess. Man, that's good. He's planned it out. He knows what you're supposed to do, and he has empowered you to accomplish everything that he's called you to do, but we've settled. Here's three definitions of settled that I want to expound on today. Number one, settled means to agree to something less than satisfactory. Say you're in a lawsuit, and you're suing a company for $10 million. You don't want to have to pay for the litigation, right? So they offer you a settlement. Well, you want $10 million, we'll give you five if you just avoid all of this chaos, all this stuff, all this months of litigation, and you being on the stand and having to take blood pressure pills because your blood pressure's up, all this stuff. If you'll just settle right now, we'll give you something. It's not as much as you deserve, but we'll give you something. That's a definition that I want to hit on today. Number two, a definition of settled is to make a permanent home. Or take up a residence. Like the pioneers, they came over here and they began to settle. They began to make houses where they were not supposed to make houses. It wasn't their land. It belonged to other people. But they began to settle. They began to make places of residence. And number three, the word settle means to begin to feel comfortable in a situation. Most of the church is in one of those three places of being settled. Listen to me this morning. Don't settle. Don't settle for less than God's best. Don't settle for good when God has destined you for great. The 
book of Numbers, chapter 32, verses 1 through 5. Am I scaring you yet? Good, thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> trying to keep calm. <laughs> Just obey the Lord. That sounded like church when I was a kid. Bless him, Jesus. Just obey the Lord. I love that, man. Okay, Numbers chapter 32, sorry. The Bible says this in the New King James Version. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, The city of Adaroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliela, Shabam, Nebo, and Beon, the country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel, well, it's a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. What's that next line say? But do not take us over the Jordan. You see, God had made a promise to his people that he was going to give them a land that was flowing with milk and honey. He made a promise to them, and he said, what you need to do is start a journey. And I'll tell you where to go as you go on the journey. But your final destination is a place called promise. Now listen, these, there were 12 tribes in Israel. And two and a half of the tribes, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh said, I don't really want to go all the way to the promise. I don't really want to do what it takes to get where you want me to go. I don't really want to pay the cost that it takes to go all the way into the promised land. Look, we're people of livestock. This place looks like a great place for livestock. Can we just have this land? How many times have you looked at your situation, you assessed everything, and you said, you know what? This is good enough. Good enough is not the plan of God. Good enough is not his destiny for you. He called you to greatness. Not good enough. He called the church to greatness. Not good enough. He called each and every one of you individually to greatness. And we've settled for good enough. Good enough is not enough. He wants you to be in great we're people with livestock, and it looks like a great place for livestock. Everything looked right, but it was short of God's plan. Can I tell you, you cannot always trust your eyes. That's why the Bible says you got to walk by faith and not by sight, because your eyes will lie to you many, many times, most of the time, actually. This week, my wife is getting into Christmas mood. I already told you that. She started baking, okay? I came home, and I've been working until like 9 o'clock at night. I came home at 9 o'clock at night, and she had made these brownies. Uh, Apostle Tim and Pastor Carol got us stuck on these things called killer brownies from Dorothy Lane Market. If you never had them, don't get them, or you'll be going there like five times a week. I had to buy a new wardrobe because I got so big from eating these brownies. But my wife's trying to mimic the recipe, okay? I get home, and there's this pan of brownies. She goes, what do you think? Do they look right? I'm like, yeah, they look right, you know? Except they're missing something. They have to have powdered sugar on top. Everybody, you're not a Christian if you don't put powdered sugar on your brownies. Come on. So she gets out this, this container out of the uh, cabinet, and she sifts on this powdered sugar. She's like, okay, so I took a bite. Something was wrong. <laughs> they look like killer brownies, but they did not taste like killer brownies. <laughs> I was about to get my money out and just go to Dorothy Lane and say, forget it. I said, what did you do wrong? She said, what do you mean? Don't say that to your wife. <laughs> say, Man, that was good. That was, that was good. What did you do wrong? So she took a bite. She said, oh, no. I said, what? She said, that wasn't powdered sugar. That was baking soda. <laughs> she sifted baking soda on top of brownies thinking it was powdered sugar. Listen, I, I love her, but she can't cook. <laughs> I love her, but she can't cook. She put baking soda on it, and it still looked right. I took a bite thinking I was going to taste the killer brownie, and I got a mouthful of baking soda. Listen, you can't trust your eyes because sometimes it looks sweet, and really it's so bitter you can't even swallow it. I'm not talking about brownies now. I'm talking about your life. You look around, and everything looks sweet on the outside, but you begin to really look at the thing, and you dissect it, and you realize maybe you don't have powdered sugar. Maybe it's some baking soda. Man, we've settled. Man, 
These people saw a place of livestock and they thought this is the right place for us because we have tons of livestock. Please don't make us go into the promise. Please. See, they were close, but they were not quite there. They were just short. Many of us are close, but we're not quite there. Those brownies were close, but they were not quite there. I tried to fix them. <laughs> She's like, you hold the pan upside down, and I'll get this pastry brush, and we'll try to get this stuff off there. It was still there. She's like, get a damp washcloth, and let's wipe. It didn't work, okay? I had a Snickers ice cream bar instead. Those, those are never wrong. Christians love those too. It doesn't matter what it looks like in front of you. Don't settle. You're called to a land flowing with milk and honey. I know manna tastes good. I know that it's, that it's crazy that it's falling out of the sky, children of Israel. But you were not designed for manna. Manna was supposed to be a season. You were designed and your purpose was to be in a land that flowed with milk and honey. You cannot be satisfied with manna all of your life. You cannot settle with manna when you're called to promise in a land of milk and honey. The Bible even said that grapes were so big that men had to carry them two on a pole. That's what they were called to and they were settling to a place with green grass. Do you understand the church has settled for green grass when just over over the hill, there is a promise for us where some of us are beginning to step into that new era. And today I'm inviting you, come along with us. Do not settle where you are. Do not stop short of his promise for you. Do not settle. Don't build your house close. Build your house within the walls. Settle somewhere where he's called you. Graveyards are full of people. Who have died full of potential, but chose convenience over their promise. It was convenient for them not to have to go and cross the Jordan. It was convenient. How many of us find, find and choose convenience over what he's called us to? This guy. I've done that. I've chosen convenience over what he's called me to. A couple years ago, I was in the, the BMV getting my license renewed. And the Holy Spirit told me to minister to the woman doing my picture. That's a weird place. There's a line of people behind you. You know what I mean? That's weird. I'm like, no, 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 no. And I didn't do it. And man, did I get chastised for that. I mean, like 12 months of being chastised. I walked back into that BMV the next year to renew tags on something. The same lady was there. I was like, no. <laughs> no, please. You know what I did? I witnessed to that lady. You know what happened? She got saved in a BMV. I began to trust his plan for my life. Recently, I was working at a Catholic church, and the priest said, Mike, would you come into the office with me for a while? See, I'd already talked to him about being a minister. We had a relationship, and I sat down with the Catholic priest, and he said, you know, I've been in this for 40 years. And I just don't know if Catholicism is right for me anymore. Tell me what gives you so much joy in your faith. And you know that I sat in the office of a Catholic priest in the city of Cincinnati, and I witnessed to him about the goodness and the grace and the gospel and how Jesus paid the sacrifice so that not just he could go before the Father, but that all of us could go before the Father. And he said, I don't know what it is, but I, I got to have whatever you have. And I was able to witness to a Catholic priest who was paying me to be there. Because I trust the purpose. I didn't settle with just painting the cross on the outside of the building. I knew I came there with a purpose. I could have just settled for getting the check and cashing it, but I knew I had a purpose. And when I went in there, I accomplished that purpose. Listen, you don't have to be a full-time minister getting paid from a church to accomplish a purpose. You can walk right into the factory and accomplish your purchase. You, purpose. You can walk right into the lunch lady line, and you can accomplish your purpose. You can pray over those children as they walk by you in the hospital. You can go into the room and silently do your purpose because you're called to so much more than just living a mundane life. Do not settle beyond your promise or in front of your promise. Find yourself right in the center of it. Man, find yourself in the center. Don't settle. Don't get to the end of your life and say, I could have. Start moving now. You know what settling means? Stop moving. 
When a pioneer settles, they stop moving. They just find a place and they rest. It is not time for you to rest. It's time for you to stand up and it's time for you to war. The battle is not over yet. You've got some fight left in you. I believe that Oasis has some fight left in it. I believe Pastor Carol and Apostle Tim, I know they got some fight left in them. And I believe I'm in a room full of people that say, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do whatever it takes to see this thing accomplished. I want my promise, and I will not settle. Everything that God has destined for you is on the other side of you not settling. Everything he's planned for you is on the other side of you not settling. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says this. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian handmaiden whose servant's name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, and perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. See, in chapter 15, Abram's talking to God about his wealth. He said, you've given me all this wealth. You've given me all this stuff, and I have no heir to leave it to. I'm going to have to leave it to my servants. I have no heir. God looks at Abram and he says, look up at the stars in the sky. See, your descendants are going to be like these stars. You can't even number them. You're going to have a son. Abram says, okay, you know, all right. He gets home and they start seeing the circumstances don't line up with God's word. Sarah's like, you know I can't have babies. You know I can't. But I'm I'm supposed to have a son. You know I can't do it. But God said, I know what God said, but the circumstances say no, so... Let's make this happen on our own. Here's my handmaid. Have a baby with her. And just maybe, just maybe we'll get an heir out of this. And Abram takes things into his own hands that God wanted in his hand. He jumped the gun because he thought he was at the expiration date. Many of you are thinking that you're getting close to your expiration date. And that's a scary place to be because you start doing things on your own that God never called you to do. So Abram takes matters into his own hands. Even though the circumstances didn't line up with God's promise, Abram had a son named Ishmael. See, Ishmael was a product of good intentions. He wanted to fulfill the word of the Lord, but he did not wait on the Lord. Most people give up and settle in the place called wait. I say it all the time. We want to microwave God, but really he's a crockpot God. Anything that you get fast is not good. If it comes quickly, it will go quickly. But if it's something that takes a little bit of time, man, you know it's going to be worth it when it's over. That's why we all look forward to Thanksgiving, because we know that someone is going to be in the kitchen for five or six hours. You don't look that that, uh, forward to the McDonald's drive-thru, am I right? A Big Mac just don't do what turkey and stuffing does, because it takes a little bit of time. Abram, Abram settled for a French fry. Instead of a turkey dinner. He took matters into his own hands and he produced Ishmael. How many Ishmaels have we birthed trying to make things happen alone? How many? Technically, Ishmael was Abram's son. Technically, he was the heir to Abram's fortunes, but he wasn't the promised one. He was close, but not quite. Not the authentic son. He was a counterfeit. You know what a counterfeit is? It's something that was made without the consent of the designer. It was a counterfeit. Shanna wanted a Louis Vuitton purse, okay? <laughs> this is, oh, this got me in trouble. <laughs> she wanted this thing bad, and it was like our eight-year anniversary or something. I'm like, I'm going to get her one of those purses. So uh, I went to Kenwood Mall, and I saw that they were like $1,600. And I'm like, 
Nice try. Let's check eBay. <laughs> so I found a Fooey Laton purse. I didn't know it. It said it was authentic, okay? It was like $600. I'm like, oh, someone just didn't want the purse anymore. I got an awesome deal. Yes! So I got that thing, and I wrapped it up, and it was our anniversary, and she gave me something. I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> I handed her this bag with this purse, and I was thinking she's going to be like, ah! Right? She opened it, she's like, when, husbands, when you get these eyes, you know you did something wrong. You just got to say sorry whether you know you did it wrong or not, okay? She said, this is not authentic. I said, there's a card that came with it. She said, you don't think they can print a little fake card that says authentic? She's like, this is fake. She's like, how much money did you spend for this? I was like, uh, five or six hundred bucks. She's like, man, you got ripped off. See, I thought I was getting her something that she wanted. But in reality, I wasn't willing to pay the, in reality, I wasn't willing to pay the price for the authentic thing. So I tried to fake her out and think I got a good deal on something. In reality, it was not authentic. You know why it wasn't authentic? Because it did not get the designer's approval. Secondly, it did not have the quality that the original would have had. And it did not exactly look right. You see, to my eye, I thought it looked exactly the same. But to her eye, it was discerning. She opened the box and knew it. She knew what she was looking for and realized that it was fake immediately. So I did the PayPal thing, and they reimbursed me for it. They said, keep the goods. You don't even send it back to them. So I'm like, well, what are we going to do with this? Resell it? <laughs> she said, you're not selling that thing. So we donated it to the barrels that we send to Jamaica every year. There's some girl in Jamaica walking down the street with a fake Louis Vuitton thinking she's something. She said, look at this. She never carried that purse. <laughs> Because it was fake. And then she said something that, listen, gentlemen, listen to your wives when they speak. Bill Johnson once said that God's voice sounds an awful lot like your wife. <laughs> Can any of the men in this room say amen? Yeah. This is what Shanna said. She said, if you have one thing that is not authentic, people will question whether anything that you have is authentic. And I said, you are a prophet of the Lord. <laughs> I told Apostle Tim, most of my sermons come from her anyway. He said, well, we're going to quit paying you. We're going to have her come and preach. Listen to your wife. She said, if anything is not authentic, most people think that nothing is authentic. Don't settle for a counterfeit. Whew. Man, I'm preaching today. I know I'm not spitting to the third and fourth row, but I'm preaching today. Don't you settle for a, something that's not authentic. Don't you settle for a counterfeit. Don't you settle for a fake when you're supposed to have the real thing. I still haven't got her the real thing. I just can't pull the trigger on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. You keep making your money. You buy yourself that in about 20 years. I bought her a car, but I can't spend that much on a purse. I'm sorry. You might be able to do it. But she still hasn't got the authentic thing yet. And you know what? She's willing to wait. Instead of settling for the fake and carrying it around, she's willing to wait to a point where we can say, okay, I'm going to do it. Don't tell her, but she may be getting that thing soon because she waited. She wanted it, and she waited. And because I'm a good husband, I want her to have what she wants. And because God is a good God, he wants you to have everything that you desire. It may not come when you want it, but he wants you to have everything that your heart desires. If you being good know how to, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does the Father give his Holy Spirit to those that want it? He's good, and his goodness will allow you to walk into your promise if you're able to wait. Don't settle for a counterfeit. God's promises are yes and amen. If he said it, he will do it. If you do not settle. I thought about Ananias and Sapphira. And then this is New Testament. They go into the apostles and they sell a piece of land and they lay an amount of money at the apostles' feet. And they say, we've given you all everything. And the apostle says, Peter says, is this everything from the land sale? He didn't ask for everything, but they wanted to pretend it was everything. Yes, it was everything from the land sale. Ananias is standing there and Peter says, you've lied to us and you've lied to the Holy Spirit. These men around you are going to carry you out of this place today. The Bible says that because Ananias tried to do a counterfeit thing in the presence of the Holy Spirit, that he died there that day. His wife comes in a little later not knowing that her husband died. And the apostles say, did you guys give all of your money to us? 
Yes, we gave every drop of it. I said, man, I hate to say this, but the same men that carried your husband out of here earlier, they're gonna, he's going to carry you out of here because you've tried to produce a counterfeit in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Much of the church today has tried to produce a counterfeit in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and God has had enough. He's done with fake. He's ready for authentic. And I believe I'm in a room with some people that say, I want the authentic too. I don't want the fake any longer. I want the real thing. I'm not willing to settle for fake when real is within my reach. We need authenticity in the church of God today. Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 through 19. The Bible says this in the New King James. Then God said to Abram, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abram fell on his face and he laughed. How many times has God said something to you and you said, yeah, I can't do that. He fell on his face and he laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. See, he tried to push that, that counterfeit on God again. God said, I got a son for you. And Abram said, yep, here he is, Ishmael. God says something that's amazing next. Then God said, no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. You see, your plan, Abram, doesn't work with my plan. You got ahead of, you got the horse, uh, the cart above the horse. You went a little bit too fast. And no, I'm not going to bless the mess, okay? I'm not going to bless that thing. I've got another purpose. And just because you messed up doesn't mean it's over. Just because you gave birth to Ishmael doesn't mean that my original promise is over. Listen, Ishmael may already be here, but you've got an Isaac in your loins. Listen, Sarah may be dried up. She may not be able to have children. It may seem as though she's never going to be able to have a baby. She may be barren, but within her are nations, and within her are kings. I come to prophesy to some dry, dead things today and say within you there are nations, and within you there are kings, if you'll be willing not to settle. Look at your neighbor and say, don't. Come on, say it. Don't. Don't settle. Man, I took you to old church. Look at your other neighbor. You say, my neighbor don't even go to this church. <laughs> Look at the other person on the other side and say, don't settle. Don't settle. Sarah may be past her prime, but within her is something that's going to be great if you'll just wait. Don't you dare settle for a counterfeit. His promises are yes, and his promises are amen. Ch uh, John chapter 21. Let's get this thing going real quick. I'll get you out of here in time to beat those Baptists. The Bible says this, John 21, verse 2 in the King James Version. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I'm going fishing. They said unto him, we also go with thee. You see, this is right after Jesus was, was killed brutally, hung on a cross and buried in a grave. This is, right after, this is right after they witnessed everything they'd given their life to for three years, decimate in front of their eyes in moments. All hope seemed lost. And Peter said, you know what, guys? I'm going fishing. <laughs> Forget it all. I'm going fishing. I do that a few times a year. Forget it all. Close the business down. I'm going fishing. It was his place of comfort. Did I go a fishing? They said unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Have you any meat? These men were professional fishermen, and they toiled all night long, and the Bible says they caught nothing. They're about to give up, and a man on the shore yells at them, Do you have any meat? 
No, I think immediately their mind would have went back to the time when Jesus is sitting on a well. And they say, aren't you hungry? Don't you want to come with us into town? You see, he's waiting for a woman who had five husbands, and he's living with one that's not her husband. They say, aren't you hungry? Jesus looks at them, and he says, my meat is to do the will of the Father who sent me. He yells at them, do you have any meat? In reality, he's saying, are you doing the will of the Father who sent you? Should you really be fishing right now? The Bible says we don't have anything. We, we, we beat our head against this boat. And nothing has happened that worked. And this stranger on the, on the land says, cast your net to the other side. Most people would have thought he was crazy. That'd be like you coming onto a paint job and telling me what to do. Right? That's my profession. I know. I walk on a job, I know exactly what to do and what order to do it. That'd be like someone walking onto my job and saying, hey, you need to do this, and then you'll be productive. I'd look at him and be like, go fly a kite. I've been doing this my whole life. My dad's been doing it for 45 years, and he's right here beside me. You ain't telling me what to do. But these men were desperate. They were desperate. So they reluctantly did, as the stranger said, and put their net on the other side. The Bible said that they drew a measure of fish that they could not even bring in. John, being the prophet, said, it is the Lord. And Peter, being the apostle, said, I got to get to him. And he took off his outer garment and swam to where he was because he realized he had settled for less. Then why are you fishing for fish when I called you to fish for men? You see, you're finding no success fishing for fish because it's not your purpose anymore. What have you been beating your head against and you've been finding no success? You might have had that calling in a season, but it may be a season where it's time for you to put up the pole and start fishing for men. You see, they had settled for comfort. He'd settled. But Peter, you're the rock. And upon, upon your revelation, I'm going to build this church. You're not a fisherman anymore. You're going to head up this thing, this, this kingdom thrust that's about to happen on earth. You're called to more than this. You're right on the brink. You're so close. The day of Pentecost is just a few days away, Peter, if you'll just not settle for staying in a boat. In just a few days, you'll be preaching a sermon and 3,000 will turn to God in one day. If you'll just not settle with comfort, Peter, get off that boat, Peter. Come on. You're called to more. Don't settle. Do not settle any longer. You're called to so much more. Fishing was comfort. It felt comfortable. But feelings are not your friend. Write this down if you're taking notes. Feelings will keep you out of the plan of God 100% of the time. And the church said, Feelings will keep you out of his plan 100% of, a, of the time. They were skilled fishermen. They toiled all night, but they had zero success because they weren't doing the will of the one who sent them. Jesus didn't tell them to change the bait. Jesus did not tell them to move the boat. Jesus did not tell them to change their fishing knots or to flip out their net. He simply said, don't give up. And settle for nothing. Throw your nets on the other side of the vessel. Don't change anything. Just throw your nets on the other side of the vessel. Because watch what happens when you follow heaven's orders. Without heaven's orders, zero. Jesus says one thing and it's so much abundance they can't even lift it out of the water. Only thing you have to do to find success in all areas and all measures of your life is just wait for the word of heaven. And I promise you that when heaven says it's accomplished it will be accomplished. The church has been going too long without heaven's approval. And today heaven is saying do what I'm saying and you'll see the results that you're expecting. Wait on his word, and you'll see multiplied fish that you can't even bring into the boat. Don't settle for defeat. God hasn't placed you in this predicament and planned for you to fail. He hasn't planned for your partial success. He predestined you for total victory. Total victory. Not partial victory. Total victory. Mark chapter 8. Verse 22, I'm landing this plane. When they arrived at Bethsaida, this is the Passion Translation. If you don't have this translation, 
by it. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, begging him to touch him and heal him. So Jesus led him as his sighted guide outside of the village. He placed his own saliva on the man's eyes and covered them with his hands. Then he asked him, now do you see anything? Yes, he said, my sight is coming back. I'm beginning to see people, but they look like trees, like walking trees. Jesus put his hands over the man's eyes a second time and made him look up. The man opened his eyes wide, and he could see everything perfectly. His eyesight was completely restored. This is the only time in Scripture where Jesus has to pray for someone or touch someone twice. I think it's a prophetic picture of a church and an end time that has partial vision but not completeness. I believe that it's a picture of a people that are settling for seeing halfway, not seeing the fullness, not, 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 being, not doing what they were designed to do. Your eyes were designed to see so that you could get around, you could walk, and you could accomplish things. But his eyes were just giving him a blurry outcast of what, what things were. Well, they don't look like real men. They look like trees, but I can see something. I believe that many people under the sound of my voice today have received a touch from God. But they're settled for a place of blurred vision. I believe they settled for a place where men look like trees. When God said, no, you're, you're called to completeness. I'm not okay with you walking around seeing men look like trees. You know what? I know I've already spit on you. I know I've already touched you. But I, I can't let you walk around like this any longer. I'm not going to let you settle for part way. Come back to me. And when he came back and he put his hands on him, his vision was completely restored. I believe today, if you'll just let him have one second touch. I believe he's already touched many of you. But if he, you'll let him reach out his hand again today, that your vision will be completely restored and you'll see in wholeness not settled don't settle for partiality don't settle for partial victory when you were called to complete victory is there anyone in the room that says I don't want this partial touch anymore I'm tired of the partial I want the fullness I want all of it I want everything you've got planned and destined for me I'm tired of living my life in a place called settled I'm tired of living my life in this settlement that's not not everything you've called me to be, I'm destined for more. And today I'm coming after a second touch. Is that anybody in this room? That's me. I want a second touch. I want a second touch. I'm not happy where I'm at. I'm not happy with the state of the church in America. We need a second touch. We can't settle anymore. Rachel, can you help me with the music this morning? I'm tired of living settled. I'm tired of settling right outside of my promise. I'm tired of settling for a counterfeit. I'm tired of settling for comfort. There's more. If you got anything out of this sermon today, just write this down. There is more. There is more. If you could sum up my entire ministry, my entire life, three words, there is more. There is more. If I could make you believe it today, I would make you believe. I would show you that there's a God that can do exceeding and abundantly. Above all, you could ask or think, I cannot make you believe it, but I can just show you a picture of a God who has a perfect plan for your life, even though you're not in perfect circumstances. He says, if you will not settle, I will find a way to get you where you're supposed to go, if you'll just trust me. Many people live their entire Christian lives being touched but not being whole. We have to stop settling for less than God's best. We need a second touch. Stand to your feet in this room.